Back in April of this year, Adobe put out a pretty significant update to their Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw applications. And the biggest piece of that came to specifically Lightroom and Lightroom Classic, and that was bringing the tone curve controls into masking. Now, when I did my what's new in Lightroom update video back in April, I did kind of a quick run through of tone curves and how to use it in masking, but I didn't go into detail about how to use the tone curve itself specifically. So that's what I'm gonna be addressing in this video here today. I'll cover what the tone curve is, what the different tools within the tone curve are, and then show some examples, both on just kind of a standard test pattern, as well as within some images, how you can use tone curves both globally and within masking to really refine the contrast and color controls within your images. So we're gonna jump into that really quickly here. Before I do so though, just a quick, quick blurb. If you've watched my last few videos, you might be a little sick of me talking about it. But just a reminder that I am taking pre-orders on my second limited edition print folio collection, Look for the Light Volume 2. If you pre-order it by November 15th, 2023, you'll receive a bonus print for free. So that gives you 11 prints for one low price. And if you purchase both volume one and volume two together, you'll actually receive 20% off both folios as long as they're in your cart when you check out. Shameless self-promotion out of the way, let's get to it. So here we are in Lightroom Classic. Now it's important to understand that this is all gonna work the same whether you're in Lightroom Classic, Lightroom or Lightroom Desktop, Lightroom Cloud as it's called, or Adobe Camera Raw. So as I said, we're gonna start off with kind of this test pattern here to help you understand how the tone curve tool works from a technical standpoint. And then we'll go into some real world examples of how it can be leveraged to really maximize the contrast control you have over your images when you're working on your processing. So first things first, let's talk about contrast specifically since that's really what tone curve is gonna be about. So obviously if we go into our basic panel, you have your standard contrast slider. And if I pull it to the left, I'm reducing contrast. If I pull it to the right, I'm increasing contrast, meaning that there's bigger variations between some of these tones. However, the problem with using this slider on its own as it's designed is I don't have control over specifically where that contrast is being applied. It's just taking whatever Adobe engineers came up with in terms of the algorithm and applying contrast via the slider and applying it that way. Whereas I might wanna specifically target contrast between two of these specific bars, or something of that nature that the slider is not going to give me the ability to do on its own. Now, when I do come into my images, generally speaking, if this contrast slider is defaulted at zero, as it is, I typically drop this down anywhere from about minus 15 to minus 30. Kind of depends on the image. Adobe several years ago actually updated this contrast slider. So what we see as zero today is really a quote unquote, punchier level of contrast than what we had in years past. And since I'm using tone curve to target in where specifically I wanna apply contrast, I wanna pull a little bit of that default contrast with the global contrast slider out. So for this, there's not gonna be a huge difference just because of the nature of this test pattern, but let's just drop it down to minus 25, just for the sake of example. Now, going into the tone curve itself, let's start off with the different areas. So we have, five different options here along the top. You've got your parametric curve, your point curve, a red channel curve, a green channel curve, and finally a blue channel curve. And if I click into these last three specifically, you'll see that each is split into two different tones. So you've got red and cyan, green and magenta, and yellow and blue. Now we'll get to those here in a moment. Let's go back to the parametric curve and start there because that's really where the basic concepts are gonna come into play. Now, if you look at the parametric curve here, one way to think about this is working with a tone curve with training wheels. It's not going to let you do anything too overly drastic or extreme, which is good because it kind of provides some guardrails, but it's bad because it is obviously going to limit what you can do. In some images, you may want to get a little funky and the parametric curve isn't necessarily going to let you do so. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I just come out to the curve and I grab a point and I start pulling it up, I'm making some pretty significant changes with my mouse, but you can see that the actual changes being applied to the curve are pretty limited. And the range that's being impacted on the test pattern is pretty limited as well. Now, if I come up and double click and adjust, I can reset that. Now, one important thing to note is when you double click on adjust like this and hold down alter option to reset a curve, it's not only going to reset the curve that you're currently working on, it's going to reset all five curves. So just something to be aware of. If you screw up one of the curves, you need to kind of delete it out individually as opposed to resetting the entire panel. Otherwise you're going to lose all your other work if you've got adjustments on other curves. So anyways, that out of the way. 
You'll notice down at the bottom of this, as I move my cursor from left to right, there's a designation being called out that I'm either in the shadow zone, the darks zone, the lights, or the highlights. So the highlights are going to be the brightest part of the image. Lights are going to be kind of the middle brights or middle lights. Then we're going to go into our middle darks. And then finally, our darkest tones. Another way to visualize this is you'll notice this little circular icon up here. If you hover on it, adjust tone curve by dragging in the photo. So if I click on this, and move out to the image, you can see that my cursor is now indicating a target. And then that little circle with up and down arrows indicates I can drag up and down when I'm clicking and holding on a part of the image to make an adjustment. So we can see right now, if we look over as I move my cursor across the image from right to left, starting out in the white, it's in the upper right corner, meaning it is maxed out. And if you look at the value in the upper left corner of the curve box, it reads 255, 255. That means you started at pure white, you're still at pure white. As I move to the left, you can see that point move down to the next spike on the histogram in the background of the curve box. And you can see now the reading is 212, 212. Move again. Once again, we move into a different portion of the curve, 159, 159. 111, 111, 85, 85, all the way to zero slash zero, all the way in the lower left corner where I'm at pure black. What this point curve does is instead of making an arbitrary adjustment by selecting a point on the curve, I can just come out to a specific tonal range in the image. And as long as I click and hold, as I move my cursor up and down on screen, I'm targeting that area. And you can see what's happening to the curve, but you can also see that the highlight slider is moving as well because I'm making adjustments in a brighter portion of the image. So let's say I wanted to bring this up and try to max it out to full white. Hopefully you can see on the screen recording, I can't quite get there. And actually, if we look at the readout in the upper left of the box of the tone curve, we've got a reading of 212, 247. So that means this particular area that I've selected with the target adjustment tool started at a white value or a luminance value of 212, and I've adjusted it up to 247, but if you recall, 255 indicates pure white. So even though I'm dragging up as much as I can, I can't get all the way to pure white. Conversely, if I click and drag and try to bring it all the way to black, I'm even more restricted. I can only bring it down to 176, where black would be zero. And then I could come over to, say, this column here, and maybe I want to lift this up. So now I'm in the darks range. You can see the dark slider is changing. And again, I'm limited to how far I can lift it. I've taken it from a value of 111 to 166, but I'm nowhere near that limit of 255. So this is where I say the parametric curve is kind of working with training wheels. Also, you'll see here, I can't bring it all the way down to zero to turn this column completely black. Now, the other thing we can do, if I come in here and double click on the word adjust, that's gonna reset the curve. The other thing we can do is move the sliders instead of worrying about picking a point on the curve or using the target adjustment tool out on the image. I can just come in here and start playing with sliders and see what I can get to. But again, you're going to be limited to an extent in terms of how an extreme of an adjustment you're able to make. And then the last thing to talk about on the parametric curve is these little three points at the bottom of the curve box itself. So again, we already talked about Leftmost is shadows, then you get in darks, then lights, then highlights. These grab points let you adjust the scope of those individual zones. So if I wanted to say, well, I want the tone curve to treat more of the image as shadows, I can move this point to the right. And now my shadows is going to be anything to the left of that point that I just dragged over to the right. Conversely, I can narrow the range of shadows and say, well, I want a narrower band that's considered shadows, and now I've got a much wider band that's considered darks. So that's going to change how it affects the image as well. So whereas before, maybe this second column here would have been considered in the shadows range, now it's being picked up in the dark. So an adjustment on the dark slider or the dark portion of the curve is going to impact that area. Now, all of that said, the parametric curve is kind of good when you're starting out. And it is nice that you can make adjustments on the parametric curve as well as on the point curve, which we're going to get into in a moment. However, what I would really recommend is, especially once you're feeling fairly comfortable with these curve adjustments, I personally don't really bother with the parametric curve because it tends to limit what I want to do. And I typically don't go too extreme, but sometimes you do want to make a bigger adjustment. And the parametric curve, as we've seen, isn't going to necessarily let us do that. 
So I'm going to clear this out on the parametric curve, and we're going to look at how the point curve varies pretty significantly from the parametric and where it can give you some far greater control over the adjustments you're making to the contrast in your image. So again, we're going to double click on the word adjust to reset the curve and a reminder that that's going to reset anything that you've got, whether it's on one of the RGB channels, the point curve or the parametric. So it's going to wipe out the entire curve adjustment across all five of those. Just a reminder, double click. We're now back to a straight line and let's click in to edit our point curve. So right away, as we go between these two, you'll notice that the point curve, we lose this region section and these points along the bottom that allow us to adjust the scope or scale or width of this individual regions. As I come back over and click on the point curve again, all of that goes away. Now you do have some presets down here. You've got a linear point curve, a medium contrast, and a strong contrast. If I click on medium contrast, you can see it's applying a fairly subtle curve here with multiple points selected. Conversely, if I come into strong contrast, it's a little bit of a stronger curve that's applied automatically. I generally just start with linear and make my adjustments from there. Now let's get into how we know what we're doing with the point curve in terms of adding or removing contrast. So again, if the upper right is 255, meaning pure white, and the lower left corner is zero, meaning pure black, as we move either of these extreme points or maxed value points, we're gonna apply a significant difference to the image. And we can already see that unlike with the parametric curve, where I can never change any of the columns fully to either pure white or pure black, now simply by moving over this bottom black point, I'm shifting over which values in the image I want to be black. If I bring this all the way back over and I lift it instead, I'm gonna be lifting the luminosity of those darker ranges all the way up to making the image pure white. Conversely, if I were to come over here and grab this upper point, my white point, and drag it all the way down, you can see I've just inverted the image. Now, if I double click to reset this, You'll notice that essentially what we're doing by setting our black and white points is we're increasing the contrast of the image. So the steeper any given portion of the curve is, the stronger the contrast being applied to that tonal range of the image. And this is a little bit hard to see on the example, but you've got these little spikes in the background of the curve box. That's my histogram. You'll notice up here in the actual histogram, I've got corresponding spikes to indicate where each of these columns is falling within the histogram. So you've got that representation here. So I've increased my level of contrast essentially between this right hand spike and the left hand spike. And you can see that as I disable the tone curve adjustment here, I've created more contrast between those middle columns essentially. Now resetting this again, once again, we've got our target adjustment tool that I could click on, so let me engage that. And if you remember with the parametric curve, when I clicked and dragged up and down with this, I could never make this second to last column pure white, and I could not get anywhere close to making it pure black. But now if I click up and down, I can make it pure white, click down, or rather drag down, and I can make it pure black. Now you could say, but what if I don't want to impact the entire image like this, and I really want to just try to target contrast within a specific couple of columns. Well, again, if I reset this, engage my target adjustment tool again, I could come here and pull up on this column and then click and pull down on this column. And I've increased significantly the contrast between those two middle columns, but I've still impacted the outer columns as well. So what I could then do is come in here and click and try to pull this back down closer to the default curve line essentially. So you'll see a faint 45 degree angle line here. That's your starting point. Also the way to look at it is if I hover on this point, it's showing me that I started at 212 and I'm currently at 214. So I could bring it down a little bit more. I could also conversely come down here and just type in 212 and that's gonna place it exactly where my input value, the original value was 212. Now the output value or the adjusted value with this curve, this column is back at 212. Now it's not gonna be exact, so you might wanna come in here and maybe pull this one down and narrow it. I'm clicking anywhere on the tone curve I want 
to apply additional points. And you can see now it's getting weird down here. So I would probably want to apply another point, say around here and then around here. And now we know that this is the point that I applied with the target adjustment tool. If I pull it down, I'm going to be increasing the darkness or lowering the brightness of that column. And because I've got these additional points, it's helping control the impact on the other columns in the image. Now you can see we've got a big spike here and you can see that it's always keeping a curve in the line that you're adjusting. I'm, I don't know how best to explain it, but as I pull down on this, this area of the curve is going up. If I want to try to control that, I would just click add another point and pull it down and get it as close to that original input value as possible. Or again, I can type in the actual value I want. Now, as I disable this temporarily, you can see I've really only impacted those center two columns. Again, I don't have anywhere near this level of control of where I'm applying contrast in the image if I'm just using that contrast slider that I showed at the very beginning. So that's where, yes, it's a tool to add and remove contrast in the image, but it's a very inflexible tool. You, you don't have the control that the tone curve is gonna give you. So let's jump back in here. Now I've made a mess of this curve. This is an extreme adjustment. Almost never would I have a curve that looks like this on an actual image. Let me clear this out and we'll jump into the RGB channels real quickly. So if I go into the red channel, this is similar to color grading and it allows me to add a color tone. But again, just like with contrast, it allows me to do it in a specific part of the histogram of the image. Now with color grading, you're, you have the ability to come in here and target your midtones, your shadows and your highlights. But with the tone curve, I can apply a color cast to any part of the image I want, whether it's a highlight, midtone, shadow, very specific narrow band of it, just like we saw in that last example where I've got a really crazy curve with very small adjustments between all the points that I added to it. The downside to this from a color grading standpoint is obviously I don't have a color wheel that I can just select from and choose any color I want. If I were to come in here and turn on my target adjustment tool again, and I come out to this second from the right column, as I click and drag down, it's adding cyan into the image. As I click and drag up, I'm adding red into the image. If I wanted to have red highlights, but cyan darks, I would just simply come out to the darks and pull those down. And we can see that we've got the red tones in the brighter ranges and the cyan tones in the darker ranges. And that's how it's going to work for all three of the RGB channels. Now, if I come to the green channel and hit the target adjustment tool, same concept as I pull it up, it's going to shift things green, pull it down. It's going to shift things towards magenta. And once again, if I wanted to have this one be green instead of magenta, I would just come in and select that. And again, you can do it kind of section by section of the image as you want. And again, you're getting a pretty wild curve, but an example, once again, of how you have this very refined control over where you're making your adjustments. Okay, now that we've looked at it in depth from a technical standpoint of how it works, let's go into some actual images and show you what you can do in a, in a real life image that makes a little bit more sense from a real world example than using a test pattern like this. All right, so here's our first quote unquote real world example of how we can implement the tone curve to make some very drastic changes to an image very, very quickly. Now, if I close out tone curve, you'll notice that none of the eyeballs here are highlighted, which means I've made no other adjustments to this image at this point. If I come into tone curve, I'm on the point curve tool, which again is what I recommend using, especially once you're familiar or more familiar with how the tone curve functionality works. Now, the first thing I would typically do on an image like this is hit the J key. Now, by doing that, I've got white boxes around my clipping warnings on my histogram. If I hit J again, the white boxes go away, meaning that they're no longer enabled. So by enabling this, I'll know if I start clipping either my highlights or my shadows in the image as I work with the tone curve here. The first thing I would typically do is come in and hover on the upper right or white point and set that white point level. That's something you'll hear people talk about quite frequently in processing demos or tutorials is setting the white point and setting the black point. So I'm gonna come here and hover on this, make sure that my mouse cursor has changed that up and down arrow. If it's not the up and down arrow, I don't have that point selected. I'm gonna click and hold. I'm gonna start pulling this white point in, keeping it all the way up to the top of the curve box. 
just until I start seeing a little bit of clipping coming in on the cloud. So basically what I'm doing now is telling Lightroom what I want to be the brightest portion of my image. In the case of right here, where I've got some clipping in that cloud coming in represented by the red blotchiness on the cloud itself, I would be telling Lightroom, those red blotches need to be pure white. I don't wanna go quite that extreme, so I'm gonna pull off on this a little bit and just get rid of those clipping warnings. So now I've set my white point. So the brightest point of the image essentially started at a value of 227. Now it's at a value of 255, meaning I've lifted a darker value to the white point. Conversely, I'm gonna come down here to the lower left, do the same thing, make sure I've got the double up and down arrow, click and hold on this, and I'm gonna start pulling my black point in towards the right. Now, I'm not gonna get any clipping on this image, probably not unless I go, yeah, in until I go very extreme with this. Even though I don't have clipping here, this is way too extreme. So I'm gonna pull this back and I'm just gonna pull it a little bit until I think I'm at a good place visually. So now at this point on this particular image, I've set my white point and my black point. And just by doing so, I've increased the contrast in the image. You can see the cloud stands out and some of these thinner, wispier clouds are standing out a little bit more as I enable and disable this tone curve. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select my target adjustment tool. Come in here, I'm gonna pick a slightly brighter part of these wispy clouds. I'm gonna click and pull that value up. I'm brightening those little wisps. And then I'm gonna pick a darker portion of the blue sky and I'm gonna pull down on that. So now I've added a lot of contrast in the wispy areas of the image. And again, if I disable this before and after, you can see just with four real simple adjustments, setting my white point, setting my black point, and then really what I'm doing here is targeting my mid-tone contrast, I've made a significant difference on this image. Now, part of what happens when you add contrast is you also add in saturation. So something else Adobe added in back in that April update was this refined saturation slider, which lets me kind of offset or counter the inherent additional saturation that comes in with a strong contrast curve by pulling this slider to the left. So as I pull it to the left, you'll notice that I'm pulling out some of that overbaked saturation, for lack of a better way to put it, in the blues. Now you'll notice that I am introducing more clipping in the cloud. So that's something to be aware of, and that's why I hit that J key to turn on my clipping warnings because as you adjust the refined saturation, even though the curve itself isn't moving, it is changing just tonal values because of the color alterations it's making to the image, and it's gonna change your clipping point. So now what I would do is come back up here to my white point and pull that back over to the right a little bit to eliminate that clipping and make sure I've got good detail in that cloud still. So now as I turn this on and off, you can see how much contrast I've been able to add in, again, with very simple curve adjustments, and then offsetting that heavy blue saturation that came in with the contrast, offsetting that by using the refined saturation slider and pulling it back to a point that I think looks natural while retaining the heavy level of contrast that I want. Now, let me clear this out real quickly and talk about a couple keyboard shortcuts you can use that will also help you better refine and control the adjustments you're applying to a curve. Let's say you don't, for whatever reason, wanna use the target adjustment tool and you just wanna come out here and click on the curve itself to add control points to either pull up or down. So I could come here and say, okay, well, I've got a spike of pixels kind of in the upper range of the histogram, meaning it's the brighter portion of the histogram. So if I come here and add a control point and pull up, I'm gonna be adding some brightness in that range. And if I come here to the spike of pixels in the darker portion of the histogram and pull down, Again, I'm increasing the angle of the slope between these two points. So between this point and this point, I'm adding contrast. Now, sometimes when you come in here and click, it's very easy either to make too big of a movement up and down or too big of a movement left and right. As I'm moving left, I'm increasing that contrast between the two points. As I'm moving this point right, I'm decreasing the contrast. But if I hold down the Alt or Option button on my keyboard, now as I make these adjustments, I'm making big mouse movements, but very minimal adjustments are being applied to the curve itself. 
giving me more refined control to dial this in exactly where I want it to make the adjustment I want. Another shortcut is if I hold down the shift key, let's say I've got this point exactly where I want it in terms of adding or removing contrast between the two points, but I just want to either increase or decrease the luminance value of that point. As I'm moving right now, I've got the risk of I'm moving the point left and right when I really only want to move it up and down. So if I hold down the shift key, now as I move my mouse, I'm only able to move the point up or down. And then if that movement is too much on the up and down, I can also hold down shift and alt or shift and option. And now I'm making much more refined adjustments, but still only able to move the point up or down. So let's say we're happy with this contrast curve I've added in. Again, the blues have gotten very, very punchy from adding in that contrast. I'm going to take my refined saturation curve, pull this over to the left until I feel we're at a good point. Again, if we go all the way back to the right, obviously way too much blue. Pull it to the left, probably a little too little. So we'll just find a good happy in between. Now, what if we wanted to add some contrast to the wispy clouds out here? but we're happy with what's being done with the contrast in the main central cloud. And I don't wanna impact that by making adjustments to the curve for the sake of these clouds or the wispy clouds in the surrounding sky. Again, if I turn this on and off, you can see we've added contrast in. I think that central cloud stands out nicely, but if I make any adjustments to try to address the contrast as I did before in the original demo for this image, I'm also gonna be changing the impact on that central cloud. So let's undo both of those adjustments. And that's where we come into masking. And what I could do here is just use a brush. We'll just have 100 flow, 100 density, making a nice big brush. And we'll just, let me hit the O key to turn on my overlay. We'll just come in. We're gonna just go over this really quickly for the sake of the demo. I'm gonna hit the O key. And now I can come out here, use my target adjustment tool again, pick a brighter part of the wispy clouds, pick a darker part of the blue sky, and I can get some contrast added in there. We've blown out those blues a little bit with the added contrast, so I'm gonna pull this back. So now if I turn on and off, you can see we've got some additional contrast in the wispy clouds, but we haven't impacted our central cloud in the middle of the frame because we excluded that from this mask. Okay, let's look at some finished examples real quickly just to help you grasp what I do with these curves. So if I come over to this image from Oklahoma, we can see here that I've gone in and I've applied, in this case, a little bit of a weird looking curve. And this one I actually edited before we had the ability to use curves within masks. So from this tone curve standpoint, I was trying to balance it between pulling in contrast between the tree trunks and the surrounding background and the reflections of the tree trunks in the water against the darker parts of the water. But again, because I didn't have curves and masks, I couldn't do it individually for the water and then separately for the trees. I had to kind of finagle it as best as I could with this single global point curve. Now, we didn't make any adjustments to our white point on this one. I did pull in the black point a little bit. If I click on this, you can see that the original value of the pixels on this portion of the histogram was 23, so very dark, but not at zero, not black. But now I've moved that over to set my black point at this portion of the histogram. Now I'm not clipping. You can see I've got my clipping warnings on. Nothing's showing up in here in terms of clipping colors, and there's nothing on the screen that's clipping. But if I move this back over, you can see I'm losing a little bit contrast in the image. It's subtle how it's shifting, but it's there. Now, if I select my target adjustment tool, like I said, I tried to play with pulling contrast on the trunks a little bit. If I hover on this tree trunk here, you can see I'm basically aligned with that middle point on the curve. So I actually pulled this one down a little bit, trying to keep this trunk from getting too bright. If I come down in the water and hover on that, you can see that's where I lifted the point just ever so slightly to add some brightness into the reflection of the trunk. And then coming over into a darker portion of the image, you can see that I dropped this point down ever so slightly. And actually, if I click on the point, my input value was at 84. I pulled it down to 78. So very, very minimal difference that I made there. But as I turn this on and off, you can see this is a little bit more of a subtle adjustment than what we had on the last image with the clouds. 
but I've still added in very controlled specific contrast exactly where I want it to be in the image, as opposed to using the contrast slider where it's just doing algorithmically and I've got no control. Looking at another finished example, here you can see that I made a pretty significant change to my white point by pulling it over to the left. So the original value was 202. Again, I've set the white point, so 255, all the way in over here from the upper right corner. I've made a smaller adjustment to my black point, and I've pulled down to add in mid-tone contrast between these two points. And this one is a significant difference just with that curve applied. And here I've left the refined saturation slider alone because I want that punchiness of color to really emphasize the fall foliage while also adding in a significant amount of contrast that wasn't there in the original flat raw file. And then we'll tackle one last demo. So let's come over to this image from Utah. So right now this image is completely unedited. My tone curve is completely flat. So again, a straight 45 degree line. That's always gonna be my default. If I change a point on it, you can always see where that default line was. So you've got a gauge of how far above or below you've gone from that default value. Double click on the point to remove it. I've already hit the J key, so my clipping warnings are turned on. Again, if I hit it again, it's going to turn the clipping warnings off. So I'm going to make sure those are enabled with the J key. I'm going to set my white point. I'm going to pull this over. And okay, we can see we've started clipping the sky, so I'm going to back off that a little bit on the white point. Let's just set that there. Black point, we'll pull in a little bit. We don't have a whole lot of room to move on this one before we start doing any clipping, but we'll just say, let's go right about there. So if we look at a quick before and after, even though it's a relatively minor adjustment, I've made a fairly significant impact on the image already. Now we can see, especially in the snow, like it's getting pretty blue down here. Again, looking at before and after, we're increasing the intensity of the color with that added contrast. So maybe I take my refined saturation slider and pull that over to the left. In this case, I'm gonna do it fairly significantly because I want a good starting point. So I'm doing this thinking globally, looking at the image as a whole, I'm just adding in global contrast by setting my white and black points. And that's all I'm gonna do at this point. Now I'm gonna come into my masking. Let's create a sky mask. And we can hover on that, see we've got our sky mask created. Again, I could come in here and set my white point, but I've already done that. So if I try to set my white point here, I'm gonna almost immediately clip because I set the white point on the global curve. But I do have some wiggle room here to set the black point. I'm pulling that in. And again, I'm not turning anything black. I don't wanna come all the way over here and go crazy, but I'm looking to darken up the tones, shift those darkest tones a little bit closer to black. I'm adding contrast, but I'm doing it from the dark end of the histogram, if that makes sense. If I was setting the white point, I'd be adding contrast in from the brightest point of the histogram, but again, I can't do that on this particular image. So we've got that set. Then what I would do is go ahead and click my target adjustment tool again, and let's say, hey, let's brighten up these clouds a little bit, but now I'm actually removing contrast. This curve is getting flatter through a good portion of the histogram. So I'd want to then come into a darker area of the sky, maybe just down here, click and drag and pull down on that portion. And we've added a little bit of contrast in. So again, we can see with a really simple, quick adjustment, how much of a significant impact I've made to the image. Now this is probably overdone. I do have the ability to pull out some of that intense color that's been added in with my refined saturation slider. Now, if I pull this too far to the left, you can see we are introducing some clipping. So I can either not pull it so far to the left on the refined saturation slider, or I could say, well, you know what? I do want this slider that far to the left to pull out color. So how can I fix this clipping? My white point is as high and far to the right as it can go. I can't do anything more with my white point. But if I click on my target adjustment tool and just come up to this clipping portion, I can just add a new point on the curve and pull it down a smidge. So now you can see we've kind of got this tick down or reduction in contrast between these two points. So this was that bright point of the clouds I had selected initially. Now I've pulled down this part that was clipping. So I've lost a little bit of contrast between the brightest part of the clouds and the sky, but I've eliminated that clipping. So it's, again, just an example of what you can do using multiple points on the curve. And then let's say I wanted to play with contrast on the landscape itself as well. 
since I've already got the sky mask created, I can simply come in here. I can duplicate and invert this mask. And now it's going to give me an inverted sky mask or a landscape mask. It's automatically reset my curve because it's been inverted. Everything gets reset. So now once again here, I could say, well, let's set my white point. I'm adding contrast in from the right side or the bright side of the histogram. Here I've gone too far, so I've added in clipping. So let's pull that back a little bit. You can also gauge where you're going to start clipping by looking at the vertical line and seeing if it's hitting your histogram that's represented in the background of the curve box. And we can set our black point. But I'm introducing clipping pretty quickly. And also on this particular image, I don't want to add a ton of contrast to this foreground because it's in very soft light to begin with, just given the nature of the light of the scene overall. I could even pull this up a little bit and reduce the contrast. The flatter this line is, the more I'm removing contrast from the mask, or if this was a global tone curve adjustment from the image. But I'm going to go ahead and leave this here. And we've got our target adjustment tool selected. Let's come out and let's pick some of this lighter tone on the rock face or on the hoodoos. Let's brighten that up a bit. But I don't want to lose that little punchiness in the shadows. Let's just pull that down a bit. We'll zoom back out. And again, we can turn this on and off. And you can see I've probably overdone it here for the sake of the example. But again, with just setting that white point and black point, and then making two curve adjustments or two point adjustments using the target adjustment tool out on the image, I've made a significant difference to the contrast of the selected mask. And if I look at it before and after my original RAW file, and then where I'm at now, all I've done is applied that global tone curve and then two tone curve adjustments within mask, one for the sky and one for the landscape. And we've got a significant difference here just with those three simple adjustments. So I know this is a pretty lengthy <laughs> look at tone curves. Tone curves was something that really kind of befuddled me for a while in terms of how exactly they worked and how to make sense of them. Now at this point, especially with them being added into masking, frankly, I do more of my adjustments using the tone curves than just about any other adjustment tools available to me outside of things like color grading and the new point color tool and things like that. Speaking of color, one thing you'll notice is I really didn't mess with the RGB curves too much. I showed you how they work, but I didn't use them in any of my images that I demoed here. For me personally, I don't particularly like using them. I find the color curves to be very, very sensitive. It takes a very minimal or minute change to make a significant impact on the image and often, in my taste, way too much of an impact. Usually what I'll use them for is if I've got some kind of weird color cast in an image, maybe there was a strong reflected light that's kind of overpowering, or I don't know, I used an older filter on my lens and it added a weird blue cast into it or something. That's typically where I might go in and play with RGB curves to basically counter or offset that color cast. But otherwise, I really don't use those RGB curves too much. So I know I've babbled a lot here. I've covered a lot here. If you got any questions, please leave them down in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer the questions that you may have. If you found this helpful, of course, give the video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. If you really enjoyed the video and got a lot out of it, you can go down to the description below and hit the link for PayPal to make a small donation that goes towards basically directly helping me continue to produce content like this going forward. Or you can hit the thanks button down below on YouTube to make a small donation that way as well. Anything and everything is always greatly appreciated. And until next time, take care.